but something that I grasped onto in my own study to the truth was realizing that there was a pattern. Uh, there, there was a pattern to follow. Uh, my mom was a seamstress growing up. She sewed all kinds of clothes and they, even my own clothes when I was a kid. And, and I, so I knew about this pattern idea that you had to follow this pattern to arrive at what you wanted. Uh, and, and God most definitely laid that out in scripture for us. It's not something that we pick and choose what we want to do. And it's not something that, well, we will become a Christian the way that we want to become a Christian. No, he laid it out. Uh, and, and there's a pattern to follow. Let's face it, there's problems in this world. And with news of negativity and fear at every turn, what are we to do? We need an injection of positivity. There's so much good that's happening. Join in the conversation as we discuss how we can be blessed and bless others, especially in troubling times. You see, edification is a team sport. On the surface, it may appear the church is divided and discouraged. We have a huge task, and it requires a team lift to build each other up and restore unity and hope to the church. Even Jesus needed help carrying his cross. You're not alone, and we're here to show you just that. All glory to God. All right, so uh, before we get started, you ready? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Our Father in heaven, we approach your throne of grace and of mercy this morning, so thankful that you have blessed us with another day of life. We pray, Lord, as we go throughout this day, that you will help us to make the most of our opportunities, that you would present opportunities to us and help us to use them in a way that will glorify you and your kingdom. We pray a prayer for Brother Wade and myself at this time. We pray that you will help us to be uplifting, to be encouraging to our brethren and to those who are in the world. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to be pleasing to you and to serve you with with zeal and with vigor. We're so thankful, Lord, for all of the technologies and the conveniences of this world, and we pray that you will help us to use them as tools and not as masters. We know, Lord, that we have a great work ahead of us and, and that there is so much to do. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to, to do these things uh, cheerfully and without growing weary. We are so thankful, Lord, for this avenue of prayer that we can come to you at any time and that you hear us. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are discouraged, who are struggling at this time. We pray you knowing that what they're going through, that you would help them to be lifted up, to put whatever is needed in their way, that they will be able to draw closer to you. Help us, Lord, to use this avenue of, of technology to encourage our brethren and to, to help others be lifted up. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Wade, thank you so much again for coming and, and chatting with me this morning. And, and I thank know you that you, you, you have uh, just moved down here from the coast or to the coast from, from South Carolina. And uh, you came down, um, I want to say last, last summer, or it was sometime last year before all the, the COVID stuff happened. And, and uh, you met with us and, and talked to us a little bit about, about what you're doing. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what your normal uh, work is i guess <laughs> well it's hard to say normal because we're just getting started uh, my wife and i have, have decided actually a few years ago to to begin the process of uh, becoming missionaries to guam and to the philippines uh, i've worked in the philippines for the past nine years uh, part-time uh, i've spent a little over seven months i guess there uh, planting churches uh, doing a little teaching at a, a christian college there um, all sorts of stuff uh, but uh, we we really planned on working in the Philippines uh, for a lifetime, um, but Guam kind of got in our way. Uh, so we, uh, we're, we're focusing on Guam for the next uh, few years. Uh, the church is, is uh, kind of weak there. Uh, it's, it's great potential. Uh, lots of people live there. Lots of military families are in and out, uh, and uh, we want to serve all of them. But we're really focusing on the military side of it, the military families. Uh, trying to encourage them and uh, and trust me when you meet them and get to know them they're a great encouragement to you as well and i know you know that from having kiesler around you uh, but we we are still in the process of raising our support uh, but uh, right now we can't travel 
uh, as, as most know. So we decided since we moved to Southern Mississippi, we will bloom where we're planted. Uh, we're gonna be missionaries to Southern Mississippi uh, when we can't travel and, and when we're home uh, on our uh, rest time, I guess you would say. Right. All right, so just in, in a few minutes, uh, what led you to obey the gospel? Uh, I love to say the providence of God, um, and I firmly believe that. Um, we've often heard the expression, you've got to be, once you're down so low, all you can do is reach up. Well, that was kind of where I was. Uh, through uh, a series of uh, things, uh, uh, some family things, I have a brother that's, uh, he, he's in, in prison for life. Uh, that uh, that really started me down, uh, down the road, uh, I guess, of really searching. Um, we were in terrible financial shape. Uh, so I, I began to get a little bit depressed about that or a whole lot depressed about that. Uh, and uh, finally one morning, I, I quite literally woke up realizing that where I was was not where I wanted to be. Uh, that the way that I was doing things as a quote Christian uh, was not what the Bible uh, wanted me to be, what God, God's word said to do and, and to be. Uh, so I decided at that point I was going to go get my Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, quite literally go get it out of the storage unit that we had some furniture in because, you know, I wasn't using it at the time. Um, I had to go get that when I got home from work, on my way home from work that day. And for the next uh, three plus weeks, I studied intently. Uh, I wanted to find out what the Bible said. Uh, I knew that I was wrong. I, I was convinced of that. How? I don't know, but I was convinced of that. Uh, I had studied at, at some point with uh, some really great gospel preachers who uh, thankfully planted some seeds in there that, that eventually bloomed and eventually uh, sprouted. But I took my Bible and I spent three or four hours a day uh, trying to find out what this means and that means and uh, what does the Bible really say about baptism? What does the Bible really say about uh, the church government? What does the Bible really say about uh, attendance. What does the Bible say about singing and worship and such things? And and mind you, where I grew up, uh, I was I was raised a Baptist. Uh, I was a Baptist. So I was 34 years old. Uh, we were pretty much taught to despise the Church of Christ. Uh, we were in the Bible Belt. Uh, the Church of Christ was one that that held to the Bible, and they they strictly held to that. They adhered to that, and everybody else seems to despise that for some reason. Uh, I'm not saying that's the reason, but, uh, uh, but that, that does seem to be the case. It definitely was when I was young. So uh, I tried very hard to disprove everything that the Church of Christ stood for. I was just the anti-Church of Christ during those three weeks of the first part of it. Uh, fortunately, my wife was a member of the church. Her father uh, was a former elder at that time. Um, so I had good influences around me. I had good friends, all of her family members of the church. Uh, I had uh, a good friend at work that uh, uh, was actually attending preaching school at that time and uh, part-time. Uh, and he helped me with some questions as well. But mostly I, I studied myself out of, out of error into the truth. Um, as I kept trying to fight against the church, I think at about point number 20, <laughs> I thought maybe they're onto something. <laughs> maybe I was wrong about this. But, you know, stubborn me, I, I still decided that, uh, that that last Sunday or, uh, yeah, it was the last Sunday before I obeyed the gospel. I said, I'm still trying to find the church of the Bible. I want to find this. I'm, I'm searching. I want to know. So I attended with a friend of mine who was a member of, uh, it's called the Holiness Church, uh, North Alabama. And when I got there in the parking lot, I noticed something that just really struck me. And uh, it was the fact that two people carried a Bible into that building, the preacher and me. And I thought, well, this isn't it. This, this can't be the church of the, of, of the Bible. Surely, surely, if it was, they'd be holding on to that word and they would be very intently studying that thing. Well, it just so happened that afternoon that Elkmont, uh, which is now our, our overseeing congregation, our, our home congregation, uh, and, and where my wife grew up, they were holding a gospel meeting with Brother Bert Jones. I thought, yeah, I'm going to go surprise my wife. Just, just that afternoon, I'm just going to go show up. And I did. And I showed up Monday night. <laughs> I showed up Tuesday night. And I showed up Wednesday night. 
And by Saturday, I, I, I wanted to meet with a preacher, uh, Steve Ferguson, who is a very dear friend of mine, uh, especially now. I wanted to meet with Steve and, and talk about things. And uh, it didn't take long. I said, Steve, I want you to baptize me. I was baptized into the Baptist church, but I was not baptized for the remission of my sins, and I, I want to be baptized for that. So he asked me, he said, well, you want me to call Joanna? I said, no. <laughs> what was it Paul said in, in Acts 22, 16? Why, or, or then Ananias said to him, why tarryest thou? I'm not going to wait. Let's just do this. So that was, that was it. Um, uh, that was uh, the beginning of a, a wonderful, wonderful life uh, 18 years ago, as a matter of fact, October 26, 2002. Oh, what an amazing story. You know, it's so wonderful how just reading the Bible can really open up our eyes. You know, we, we learn so many things through word of mouth, through this and that. And then when we actually open it up and see for ourselves, it can really start to change things. And I always try to say, never underestimate the power of the word of God. Absolutely. And I was having a discussion yesterday with a, an old, old friend, someone I've known since I was probably four years old. Uh, and, uh, this person I love dearly, great, great individual as a, as far as the way that this person acts, it's as godly as you, as you will see. But her religion is one that is more based on emotion. It's based on how we feel, what we see, what we think, but not about what we read in the Bible. And, and that was something that, that really broke my heart. I mean, it crushed me thinking, you know, I used to be like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, um, anyway, that's, it really is when you study the word and you, you take it and you, you figure out that this is God speaking to me. I need to listen through that journey. I, um, as I studied, I, I stumbled across first Corinthians chapter three and, and verse 18 really struck out to me. Now, now that's one of the most difficult uh, chapters, I guess, to understand in the Bible. But when I got to verse 18, it, it said something to the effect of, if a man thinketh, thinketh himself to be wise, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. And it, that hit me, and I thought, wow, I've got to forget everything that I know as, as a Christian and learn. Stop right now, drop it, and learn. What does the Bible say? Instead of going to the Bible to prove what I believe, go to the Bible and let it teach me what I need to believe. Amen. And, and on that topic of learning and teaching, uh, what's something this year that you've, you've learned that's really helped you grow? A couple of things. Um, this, when I was answering your questions beforehand, I, it, I had to go back and rewrite several times, uh, but I tried to narrow it down. But, you know, number one, this, this year that I've learned is Christians need each other uh, and we need each other often. Uh, you know, when you go back and look at Acts chapter 2 and the end of it, and you look at the end of Acts chapter 4, uh, you see that the, the disciples, the Christians, were, were gathered together daily. They needed each other. God, God knew that. He planned the church that way. That's the way the church is designed. Uh, but, you know, it's not new knowledge, of course. We know we need to be around each other, but it means so much to be able to gather together to worship. And until we couldn't, I know some of you never stopped. Some of us had to because of the, uh, the, the great amount of elderly folks in our congregations. We just couldn't take the risk of, of them getting sick. And, and most of them with, where we were with some serious, serious health problems, and we were afraid for that. Uh, so what we did is our, our preacher uh, at that time would, uh, would preach on Facebook Live, and we, would, we had our own little cups and all to do the Lord's Supper, and we sang, and we did all those things at home. Well, in doing that, it made me really realize how important, how meaningful that corporate worship is uh, to be together with our, our brothers and sisters. But, you know, more than just that, I also learned or relearned, I guess, uh, on a personal level uh, what worship really is. I don't know if that makes sense, but... But as we couldn't be together with our brethren, we didn't have those sometimes outside distractions. We all understand that. Um, as we sat there and, and realized we couldn't be together, and that was the first time that I actually shed tears during worship in years. Uh, you know, I, I just, I missed being with my brethren. I missed being able to do those things together. I missed 
hearing them sing and, and, and speak to me in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I missed being able to commune together with them in the Lord's Supper. Uh, so I really learned just how important it is that, that we're together. And I, honestly, I just, it, it boggles my mind uh, that people would intentionally stay away from, from, from their brethren uh, for, for no valid reason. I'm a help to understand, work to understand, but just because I don't want to, I just can't understand that. So this year has been, like, like we've all known, it's been a whirlwind for all of us. It's been up and down and all over the place, and we don't even know what to expect tomorrow, as, as always, but, but it's just been extra this year. And what, what are some positive things, some good news that, that you've had this year, this past six months or so? Um, positive experience, good news. Honestly, uh, as we talked about uh, before we started the meeting here, God has blessed us so very much this year. In, in, in a weird year, off year, and of course on the coast, we know it's, it's really been a strange year with all the storms coming in on top of uh, the COVID problem. And of course, that's spiking down here in South uh, Mississippi. Uh, it's it's uh, difficult to choose which, which thing that has the best good news, I guess. Um, I guess narrowed down. Uh, it's the fact that we've we've not only retained the uh, the financial support that we had gained, uh, but we've also gained a little bit. Uh, for for us personally in our work, of course, we have to seek support from congregations and individuals, um, and it's a difficult process. Uh, but we haven't lost any of that uh, so far, and uh, that terrified me when this year began, as it did. I thought, wow, this this is gonna this is gonna just sink the ship for us, but it, it hasn't. Uh, we're, it's st we're still allowed to be able to go do our work when things open up. We're allowed to be able to work with the churches down here now uh, as, as they allow us to. Uh, so that, that's that been great news for me. But you know something else that uh, uh, I guess I learned? I learned that there are a lot of people who really do love my family and me. And uh, this may be hard for me to get through this because I'm a very emotional person. Uh, but as, as we moved, uh, and as we announced that we were moving, I mean, it was no secret that eventually we'd end up back down here on the coast, just didn't know which state. But as we announced that we were moving, the tears that were shed, and the tears that were shed for weeks to come, even after that, uh, knowing that we we're going to be gone, that uh, it really, that blessed me. It did, uh, to know that people cared that much. Uh, but the physical help that we got in, in actually moving, the uh, financial help, there were folks who, who gifted us uh, 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 money to be able to help us get settled down here because, you know, we're missionaries. We're not exactly rich. <laughs> um, so those things, um, of course, I've got it written down here. Now i got tears in my eyes, so I can't hardly read these things. But uh, just knowing that people cared about us as much as they do uh, really has helped me so much this year. It's helped me to keep keep going on. I knew that folks cared about us. Uh, that love us, uh, but just the way that they've shown it so much this year has, has truly been a blessing. But uh, even when we moved, uh, of course, uh, getting to come down here and uh, and uh, and be with all of you, uh, you your family is, is amazing. It really is. The Diaz family, folks that don't know it, is an amazing group of people. Uh, and I encourage you to get to know all of them uh, if you possibly can. Uh, I got to meet you and, and – uh, well, one of your brothers and your dad, what, Eric, right, uh, last year, and one, I got to meet them and uh, spent a little time with them. Uh, it was during cruise week last week because I made the mistake of booking a hotel room during that time on the beach. I'll never forget that. Um, but that's been a great, great blessing. Great news to be able to come down and be around Christians like, like yourselves. Uh, in fact, all the congregations that we've met with have been great to us. So they they're, they're taking us in with open arms. Uh, we still haven't exactly found the niche that we will, we will fill here, but uh, we know we're going to find it. But right now we're just trying to be an encouragement to others and let them be an encouragement to us. Uh, and that's working out pretty well. Wonderful. You know, it's, it's one of those things. I, I, I love the, the story you shared with, you know, how, how uncertain things are right now. And, and sometimes we, we, when we see these things, we draw assumptions that, that aren't necessarily warranted. Like, like you're saying, you, you didn't know where your support was going to come from with all the things that are happening, but yet it increased and, and, it, and it stayed, it stayed there. And, and it's just wonderful to hear these things that 
even though things seem fall, like they're falling apart all around us, things seem like they're, they're divided or, or whatever it may be on the surface. But then really when we look at it and when we, when we see God will always provide for us, God is always in control. Amen, brother. And, and it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And, and I know as, as a gospel preacher, as, uh, as, you, as you are, that, that I'm sure that you are well read. Do you have any books or uh, any books that, that you have mostly impacted your life or your most gifted books? You know, this is honestly uh, uh, the hardest question for me to answer. Uh, and I, I'm going to tell a little secret, and, and maybe no one will, will from, from there will hear it, but uh, or maybe they will. But uh, I used to love to read. I read constantly i pick up a book usually a secular book but i pick up a book and until i was finished with it i didn't set it down i mean it just that's how it was it was fun to me as a kid i read all the time and i just enjoyed it but then i went to preaching school <laughs> when i went to preaching school i was forced to read all the time and it just took the fun out of it uh so uh, i don't read as much as i used to uh and I, I, that's sad to say i do still read some uh, but as I was thinking of this, I, I thought back to one of the first books that I read uh, as a new Christian. And I, I probably bought this book uh, probably in November of 2002, right after I obeyed the gospel. And it's called The Gospel Plan of Salvation by T.W. Brents. Uh, T.W. Brents was from a little town in southern Tennessee, Fayetteville, where we actually lived right before I obeyed the gospel, strangely enough. Uh, but the book was written... In the late 1800s, it was written in the, the prose or the language of that day, and it was written in the style of, of preachers of that day. And what I mean by that is there was no sugarcoating the truth. He told it like it was. It might have even come across as abrasive at times, but he laid it out there, and, and it was up to the reader to pick it up. Uh, and, you know, while we always have to remember to speak the truth in love, uh, Ephesians 4.15, but... That is the right verse, right? It's early in the morning. <laughs> um, but we have to lay it out there. And sometimes I think we're so afraid that we're going to hurt feelings. We're so afraid that we're going to turn somebody off that we just don't tell them what they need to hear. Uh, the world has told us that love is accepting things, but the Bible tells us that love is warning them. Uh, and, and telling them the truth. And that's why I guess I appreciated that book so much. In fact, I've got to go back and read that. Um, and see, from there on, I'm trying to think of a couple more, and I actually wrote these down um, again. Uh, I, I think I told you this jokingly the other day, you or Father One, uh, so many surgeries, so many concussions, I just can't remember things like I should be able to, but um, hermeneutics. Yeah, the book, uh, the book Hermeneutics uh, by Dungan, or Dungan's students, I guess, actually, uh, really, really influenced me, helped me to understand how to interpret and, and why we interpret as we do. And, and then, of course, that led to how did we arrive at the beliefs that we hold, uh, hold so firm and so true. And it's because we use the, the principles, the, the rules of interpretation, uh, and that's how we arrived at it. Uh, you know, and when you use those things in the Bible, as you would any other book, brother, I believe we'll arrive exactly where we have. Now, there might be a thing or two that we might not have 100% uh, correct, but when it comes to the worship of God, the corporate worship, when it comes to the, uh, the authority of the Bible, authority of the scriptures, when it comes to uh, the, the government of the church, when it comes to uh, all of these things that we really are, some say dogmatic about, uh, I'm convinced that we're right because we've interpreted the Bible just as we would any other book and arrived at these conclusions. Uh, two others real quickly, Politing the Straight uh, by, by Dave Miller, uh, a great book. And then uh, the late brother, uh, Gobble Music. Um, I've lost the name of it here. I know I know this one. Uh, uh, yeah, Behold the Pattern. Um, you know, that's something that uh, I read, of course, in school, but something that I grasped onto in my own study to the truth was realizing that there was a pattern uh, there there was a pattern to follow uh, my mom was a seamstress growing up she sewed all kinds of clothes and they, even my own clothes when i was a kid and and i so i knew about this pattern idea that you had to follow this pattern to arrive at what you wanted 
Uh, and, and God most definitely laid that out in scripture for us. It's not something that we pick and choose what we want to do. And it's not something that, well, we will become a Christian the way that we want to become a Christian. No, he laid it out. Uh, and, and there's a pattern to follow. Uh, so I appreciate that book uh, because it shows us through scripture. There's, there's a pattern to, to pretty much everything. Amen. Thank you for sharing those. Those are some, those are some real good books there. I have a couple of those in my own library. I probably need to dust off and, and revisit some of those. Yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, so thinking back in your life um, and your, your ups and downs and twists and turns, what failure or apparent failure had set you up for a later success? I'm trying to keep this upbeat. And, and at the end of this, you'll figure out that it is. But it's going to be a little bit negative to arrive at a positive. I know we're trying to encourage folks, and I, and I hope that this does, but my biggest failure, I made the mistake uh, of, of uh, once thinking I was going to work, going to work with a particular uh, missionary, uh, while in his mind I was going to be working for him. You know, there's, there's a big difference there. There's a huge difference uh, philosophically, uh, working with and working for uh, well, I'm one of those that, that tends to think outside the box. I think independently. I try to look at, at what's right. I'm, I try to be a good steward of, of the Lord's money. I try to be compassionate. I'm, I'm very passionate about everything. Uh, so when I start it, I'm going to finish it uh, unless I realize that I was wrong about it. Uh, and typically, I won't tow the line just because it's the line that's supposed to be towed. That's just not me. Uh, if I find that something isn't uh, shall we say kosher uh, or something that I don't agree with, I'm, I'm going to bring that up. Um, I guess I'm wired that way, maybe to a fault. I guess that depends on who you ask. But anyway, there were things that I saw in, in, in working uh, with this person, with this group that I didn't agree with, uh, thought that were waste of the Lord's money. And uh, I brought that up. I was told to stay in your lane. <laughs> Uh, I, I was uh, compassionate at one, at one point on a, on a particular uh, event where there were elderly folks, or elder, elderly Christians there, uh, who were experiencing a, a virus that had had them down. And then we were uh, in a third world country with very little air conditioning and a very hot and overfilled room. And I got them out of there uh, because I thought it was the right thing. And I still think it's the right thing to do. Well, because of these things and because of the, uh, exchange of ideas, I guess you'd say, after that, I was uh, dismissed from that group. It absolutely killed me at the time inside. I was just starting out raising funds. I was pretty much self-supported at that time. Uh, so that was money just, just lost, you know, and, and time lost. And it was like, what am I going to do now? Uh, well, things have a way of bringing you to where, <laughs> where you want to be and where you need to be. Because of that, and by the way, back to that, it helped me better understand Paul and Barnabas' situation when they split up. They had different ideas of John Mark, and different ideas of what they wanted to do, especially concerning John Mark. But they both went different directions, but both were very effective. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes different ideas need to go different ways. As long as they're achieving the right goals, that's fine. And that's not at all to, to say anything negative about anybody else. It's just different philosophies on things. Uh, and we just, we just couldn't, couldn't match. But that gave me the opportunity to, to go and do things that I never would have gotten to do. I've been able to do the Lord's work in New Zealand. I've been on Guam uh, preaching. I've, I've been to uh, several different provinces in the Philippines that I never would have gotten to. I mean, I have thousands of Christians that, I, that are my friends now that I never would have known if I had stayed there and stayed basically in an administrative position. I, I'm not an administrator. I'm a preacher, teacher. Uh, I'm, I'm a, an evangelist. I, I like just having a Bible in my hand, go, go and holding Bible studies with people, teaching them the truth, not counting numbers and not sending out letters. That's just not me. Uh, but this has allowed me to be able to do a lot of things uh, and uh, things I've never thought I would be able to do before. God has truly blessed us uh, in what we've been able to do uh, and the things that he's accomplished. Uh, I say through us, but you know, we, we've, we've been able to do and be involved in uh, uh, 
uh, I've helped plant five different congregations. The last one was in 2017 uh, with, uh, with a very dear friend of mine. Uh, we, we did things differently. We learned that instead of uh, planting congregations, we want to establish congregations. And, and there's a big difference. Uh, planting congregations, typically, we, we go in, we have these missions, we, we baptize folks, we get it started, and for the most part, that's the end of our work there. Uh, establishing congregations is more like what Paul did. Uh, he would go in and he sent Timothy and Titus to go in and raise up leadership within these congregations, train them up, and then eventually they took over for themselves. Uh, and and that's, that's what we decided that we were going to do. So that's that's a philosophy that we try to try to keep now is establishing these congregations. That congregation now, uh, it's in a little place called Random Mercedes in Isabella, uh, Luzon. Uh, I haven't been back to it in a couple of years. I just haven't been able to because of Guam and, and, and health issues this year. But uh, they have grown to about 60 members, uh, if I understand it correctly. A good brother out of Kentucky has uh, has have provided the funds for them to buy a lot. Now they're in the process of constructing the building. Uh, very nice facilities. Uh, they're, they're definitely a light on the, on, a shining light on the hill there in, in that area. And we're, we're very proud of what, what they've been able to do and, and happy that God has blessed them as he has. Um, several other things I guess I could say there, but we don't have all day. <laughs> but uh, I am thankful for that failure, if you will. Uh, because uh, it allowed me to grow um, far beyond where I would have been able to grow if I'd have stayed with that. Uh, I never would have been able to spend five years in South Carolina for that as, as a located preacher. Uh, I, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, we wouldn't be down here, you know, uh, uh, doing what we do. Uh, so very thankful for things to work out as they are. No hard feelings at all in that, by the way. It's just uh, uh, different ideas. It's, it's great that you can look at things like that and that we can take these a pair of failures and really turn them into positives. And it, it's so important for us to remember that. It's so important for us as Christians to have that perspective because there's always going to be, we, we as humans have, have things set in our minds. You know, we have a certain thing, you know, whether it's right or not, you know, we, we, it's just how we make sense of the world. But oftentimes when things don't go our way or, it's not, or it goes unexpected, it can really derail us and to have the perspective like you're talking about to have that say, well, God is in control. And, and like uh, a, a brother just said that when, when, when God closes the door, he opens a window. Yes. And, and, and this is something that we can really uh, internalize in ourselves. And when we have these, these uh, obstacles, we can really turn them into positives. Oh, no doubt. You know, when uh, right after this happened, a, a very dear friend of mine uh, with whom I've worked in several missions over there, over in the Philippines, um, he called me as soon as he learned about it, he called me and, and he was involved with this group too. And he said, brother, I'm just, I'm just hoping this, this doesn't make you leave the church. And I said, man, why would I leave the church? <laughs> what has the church done to me? Right. Uh, but no, it had nothing to do with that. It was just, this just personalities. And, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that uh, I've had good people around me to keep my head up and, and keep me focused and to keep me going. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I appreciate the, the good words there. It, it's so good. We have to have those, those group of people around us that can help us through those valleys, because if not, we can start blaming things on God and, and start making excuses and, 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 you know, do something that we wouldn't normally have done. Yeah. So, so when you think of, um, all of your learning, all, all the things that come through your life. Do you have any quotes that you think of often or that you, you live your life by? Uh, don't really have any quotes, but some things that my dad uh, kind of instilled in me. And I guess one of those things, most importantly, and, I, and I've, I've said this from the pulpit even, uh, he taught me that when you see something that needs to be done, do it. Uh, when you see somebody that needs food, feed them. When you see somebody that needs help, you just go help them. You see a door that needs to be held open or, or, or anything like that. You see a piece of garbage on the, on the ground, just go pick it up. Don't look for a pat on the back or wait for congratulations. Just just go do it. <laughs> the joy of, of knowing that you've just done something that needed to be done is, is, is plenty of reward. Uh, and that's, that's the way he was. In fact, my dad died at the age of 59 giving furniture away 
to to a couple that didn't have anything. He just killed over on the front porch and died. Uh, so uh, at least he died doing what Dad did. Uh, so that definitely has stuck with me. Um, I always try to be someone who jumps in and does things. Uh, we've, of course, you know now down here uh, trying to jump in and find what needs to be done and and, and help out in any way that we can. Uh, the community we live in. Um, we found opportunities to, to work and we're hoping that as we work and do things physically uh, that we can give a good example of, of godly people uh, and show what Christians really are. And uh, I think we're beginning definitely getting to be uh, respected uh, because of the way that we don't talk, <laughs> the things that we don't do, uh, as well as the things that we do. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and there was another one, and, and uh, again, i got to put my old man glasses on here. Um, another one is, is work smart, not hard. Uh, that sounds kind of uh, counterintuitive, I guess, but uh, my dad told me this, and dad was a hard worker. He, wor he worked 20 hours a day at times. He'd work his regular job, come home and weld on things for other people for eight hours. Then he might work on his rental properties for three or four hours. Um, but he always told me, only work hard when you have to. Work smart. And, and the reason this means so much to me as a Christian, as a missionary, is that sometimes we get so bogged down or can get bogged down with projects. We can get bogged down with uh, this work that we got to get done where sometimes we need to step back and, and consider a different plan about it or maybe come up with a plan for it uh, to where we can conserve energy and, and use that energy towards some other positive thing. Uh, we, we get so busy, uh, even with things to do with, with the church and with church work, that we often get too busy and working too hard on some things where we could be sharing that, uh, sharing that and, and, and getting more things done and more things done effectively and efficiently. Amen. And I really like what you said there about, about the first um, quote that your, your dad had, had taught you that, that uh, when when there's something that needs to get done, just do it and, and don't expect the, the pat on the back. You know, that's something that I think brings discouragement and frustration to, pe to, to Christians more than many things because people are saying, well, I did all this work and, and I'm not getting recognized for it and, and these things, but we have to remember where our reward lies. Absolutely. And, and, and who sees it and, and who is going to reward us. You know, if we're expecting that reward from everybody around us or, or that uh, appreciation that acknowledgement for everyone around us maybe that is our reward yeah you know honestly i i guess i'm very i know i'm fortunate but i'm very fortunate in that i've always been one who was embarrassed by the pat on the back or, or or being congratulated for something or even thank for something it just I, it just it's not me i don't, I don't want to be patted on the back i just want to do it get my thing done and, and go home for the day and then thank god for another day now we have lots of people here in, in that, that we all know that are discouraged now uh, with, with uh, social distancing, with quarantines, with all these things that are happening. We have a lot of things that can bring us down. What kind of advice would you give a struggling Christian right now? Pray. Number one, pray. Uh, the time spent on your knees, standing up wherever, in heartfelt prayer to God, I know when I first obeyed the gospel, I, my prayer life was stronger than it is now, unfortunately. Um, and I know there's many of us that can say that. Uh, but that time spent just pouring my heart out to God, and of course, even now, that draws me so much closer and gives me so much encouragement to, to keep fighting on. Uh, to know that the God who created all things, see, the God of heaven, the God who gives us and sustains our lives, allows us to come before his throne and, and, and offer, or offer up or, or give him our, our pleadings, our petitions, uh, to tell him how we hurt and what we need. Uh, that is encouraging to know that he, he allows that and, and, and welcomes that. But also, I'd say to call a brother or sister in Christ, have them pray for you right then uh having someone else pray for you whether it's expected you ask for it or they just do it spontaneously that is one of the greatest feelings uh that that you can ever have i remember back years ago when i was still at, at uh, my secular job 
I had a customer one day who asked me something, and I can't remember how the exchange started, what my answer was even, but it wasn't negative, but she said, I'm going to pray for you right now. I didn't know her. I I talked to her maybe twice just getting a package signed for her, but she prayed for me. You know, it made my day. Absolutely made my day. Uh, Just to think that somebody cared enough to do that. Uh, and our brothers and sisters should and do, and I know that we need to care about uh, care about each other enough uh, to go to God in prayer for them uh, at the drop of a hat. Uh, mention them in prayer every day. Brethren, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters, especially our local congregation, every day. Call them by name. Uh, offer, offer that up to God. Um, read the Bible. Uh, that's another <laughs> no-brainer, I guess. Uh, but read the Bible. Uh, It's amazing that God, although he didn't tell us about every single situation that we would see, there's something that's applicable to it in Scripture. Every single temptation, every trial we go through, there's something that we can look at in the Bible that will help us deal with that. There's no exceptions to that that I've ever found or anybody else that I know has found. So read read the Bible. Um, Study it. Meditate on it. I know we can be uh, guilty of trying to check the boxes where we read our Bible through every year. We read the New Testament in the year or the Old Testament. Don't just read it. Consider it. Meditate upon what God is saying through those words. That will help you. Put yourself in the company of other Christians. Get out of the rut of being around the same folks that are bringing you down and get around good Christian people who are positive thinking who want to go to heaven and want you to go to heaven, uh, that will help. Uh, Get busy and serve. Uh, It's amazing how uh, just doing something for somebody else can bring you up out of a rut so, so quickly. Uh, And, of course, number one is just don't give up. (laughs) Don't give up. Uh, There is hope. Uh, You know, something that as a a preacher that I kind of had to learn, and it seems silly that you have to learn this, but, we, we preach about uh, sin. We preach about uh, all kinds of things that people need to stop and that people need to do if they're not doing. Uh, but if we don't preach about hope and don't give them hope, what's the point? Uh, and, and, and for everyone, uh, there's hope. Every sermon ought to give you hope. Even if it's at the end when we give the, the gospel plan of salvation, there's hope in that. Uh, So we we need to realize, even when we're down, that there's hope. Excellent. Excellent. It's so important for us to to be reminded of, like like you said, no-brainers. You know, these these things that we already know, that we already know them. And sometimes, like you said, when we're in that rut, we have to just get back to the basics. Get back to the basics. We, We refocus. We reset. And sometimes it's, it's hard to do that. We, we get overwhelmed. We, we get unfocused. We, we lose our focus temporarily. Uh, when, when those things happen to you, Wade, what, what do you do when, when you feel unfocused? You know, brother, that's a mean question to ask somebody with attention deficit issues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I, I lose focus constantly. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm in guilty even in the middle of, of a sermon where you've planned it, you've prepared it, you've rehearsed it, and you'll completely lose your train of thought. Of course, I guess most preachers probably have. Uh, and, and then sometimes I will lose, you know, I'll be describing something. I'll go off on a tangent and it's like, what was I talking about? Some people say that as a joke. I'm serious. I, I, I have to do that sometimes and get pushed back to where I was. But, of course, you know, as, as I've already mentioned, we're still in the process of raising our support. Uh, and, of course, this year has been – detrimental to that effort we haven't lost anything we've gained a little bit but this was going to be the year that we spent you know at least three to four months on guam and the rest of the time was going to be visiting congregations getting in there meeting with elderships and and, and finishing up our support Um, so that that's been very very difficult and because churches aren't all meeting as they were they don't really have time for missionaries to come in and report or, or get presentations. Um, that's been difficult for me. And it's kind of made me at times lose focus on, Hey, you need to be at it. You need to be making these phone calls. You need to be sending letters, making these contacts. And, 
you know, that's, I guess, where I've lose focus uh, the most this year. Uh, but I've got that same dear friend with whom uh, we, we planted the congregation there around Mercedes. Dale Byron, by the way, is his name. Uh, he's like a brother to me, uh, more so than just a brother in Christ. Uh, but he's one I can call, and uh, and he will he will put me right back to it and put me back, right back where I need to be uh, and get me refocused on, on doing those things. And I, I love him for many things, but that's that's one of the ones that, that really helps me is him putting me back in, in that direction where I need to be. Um, sometimes I find myself almost unwilling to make those phone calls just, just because, you know, the fear of rejection is a real thing. Uh, you know, we say that as, as teenagers, you don't want to ask this, this pretty girl out because you're afraid she's going to say no. You know, this is much greater than that because this is our lives we're talking about and our ability to survive um, and do the work. Uh, so uh, you hate to be told no. And, and unfortunately, I've seen so many times uh, in the church that where we, maybe this is the wrong question to get into this, but where we have justified so many things in the name of uh, expediencies. Uh, that we've gotten away from being able to send men to go and preach the gospel. You know, the, the, the Great Commission was, as you go, teach. You go and teach. That's the thing. Go and teach. Uh, teaching them what? To observe the things I've commanded you, Matthew 28, uh, 19. Uh, but we've got so used to now for uh, building buildings and doing projects that we just don't have money left for that. Uh, the, the, the main goal, which is sending evangelists to go, go reach the lost. So I've had elderships and I've had men's groups that tell me we just, we just don't have the money uh, right now, or we don't have uh, money left in our budget for that. But yet I know these other things that are going on and it's frustrating. Uh, it's discouraging. Uh, and because of those things, uh, I get to where I lose focus. Uh, that, that's getting back to that question. There, there was a purpose for that. Um, but yeah, it causes me to lose focus sometimes. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's difficult, I guess. Again, I'm one who is always trying to be busy um, and trying to find something where I can fit in, something where I can work. Um, so I guess the, the best answer to the question of how to get that focus back is just like I mentioned about a, a Christian who's, who's down, just start working. Uh, just, just put yourself in a position to go and do something. Uh, and I guess that's how I keep focusing. Back when I was preaching in, in South Carolina, there will be times when I was working on uh, sermons or Bible class lessons. And uh, I just, you know, I guess it's writer's block or whatever. It's a little loss of focus. And I would just have to stop, you know, just step back, go do something else. Wait till my, my thoughts have uh, stopped turning in circles. Uh, and, and come back to it uh, when it's fresh again. Uh, my brain, kind of like my mouth, runs constantly. Uh, and it, it's, it's sometimes difficult to make it slow down enough uh, to focus on the, on the thing that needs to be done. Uh, makes for some fun nights you know, <laughs> when your brain doesn't slow down. Uh, but uh, to regain focus, honestly, I don't have the best answer for that because I get so unfocused so often. Uh, but, but I do try to just find something to do until I can focus. And, and I guess that is my answer. Uh, trying, trying to figure out something uh, to do until it comes back to me, until I get energized on that point again. Sorry to ramble so much on that. Hey, one. Hey, I hey, hey. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I think that, but I think that's an excellent, excellent illustration there that you, you use, you know, you, some of us, uh, our, our brains are just going a mile a minute and, and it's easier for some people to stay focused than others. And, and a lot of people, um, what do you do when you can't stay focused? A lot of people will just say, well, that's just me. And then they just give up and, and not do anything. But, but you had, you mentioned several things, you know, you talked about, you know, you, you call you call a brother that, you know, that can, Hey, this is where you're supposed to be, you know, that, that can remind you where you, you need to be. You take breaks on things. You, you go and do something else until you can kind of, um, you know, get back to that even kill and, and, and you can, okay, yeah, that's exactly what I need to be doing. You know, all, all those things are, are so important for us to do. We, we don't have to have it all put together all the time to do the Lord's work effectively and, and, to, and to do those things that, that we need to be doing. And, and 
Thank you for that. I, I think that's a great example there. Now, uh, last question for you, Wade. So thinking of how things are today, all the, all the resources, all the tools, all of the opportunities we have, what's the best thing that we have going for the church that we're not taking advantage of or, or that we're underutilizing? I've got a long answer to this because I've got more than one answer. But the best thing that we have going for the church that we're not utilizing is truth. We're just not using the truth as well as we could be, as well as we should. We, uh, I mentioned this a minute ago. We've been so dulled from, from being the razor-sharp tools that, that God expects us to be. Uh, we are, we, we're afraid of ridicule. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of argument. Uh, we're afraid we're going to hurt somebody's feelings. You know, all we have to do is tell the truth. We have to tell them what, what God said about it. And it's up to them how they process that and what they do with that. And I'm afraid we just don't utilize that enough because of fear. Um, what defines, and I'm going to ask you a question here, what defines successful evangelism? What in your mind is successful evangelism? In my mind, successful evangelism is, is doing what, it, what God tells us to do. You know, we look at back at Noah. We look back at, at these, these uh, individuals that, that preach righteousness for, for many, many years with, with no response. A lot of people will, will define success in numbers. They'll, they'll want to quantify it in a way um, which, which may or may not be the case because you know, it depends on the hearts. It depends on uh, many things. We have, we have men like Peter in Acts 2 who, who preach a sermon, and you have all of these people obey. You have, and then you have the, the same or similar sermon preached in Acts 7 with, with Stephen, and they kill him. And, and so, you know, is what, was one more successful than the other? Did one have a better approach than the other? I don't think so. I, I think it's, it's uh, like you said, truth. Brother, give yourself a pat on the back. You got the answer. Exactly correct. You know, so, so many people, when you ask them that question, well, it's when you have so and so many baptisms or so and so many things happen here and so many churches. No, successful evangelism is doing what God said to do, and that's go and teach the gospel, go and preach the gospel. That's success. Uh, we can't make people uh, choose to obey the gospel. We can't make people choose to change their lives, but we can make ourselves go and do what God said to do, and that's going off them that opportunity. Um, we're worried about hurting feelings. We're in the wrong business. <laughs> it's just, that's just how it is. Uh, the gospel all in itself uh, is going to hurt feelings. It's, it's going to convict. You know, we look at the first Christians in Acts, well, the ones that first became Christians in Acts chapter two, it says they were pricked in their hearts. They were cut, they were hurt because they realized they had murdered Jesus, the son of God. Uh, it's supposed to offend us, to make us want to change. Um, there's no way that we can uh, take away the command to speak the truth in love, of course, but love is, is showing them what they need. Uh, but as a group, I think that we don't use our resources as well as we should. I mean, as the Churches of Christ and even as, as congregations, we don't use the energy of our youth enough. They have a lot to offer. Uh, yes, they need to be guided because if not, they can very quickly go off in a direction that, that they should not go and we don't want them to go. But they have energy. They've got a lot, to, a lot to offer. And including fresh ideas about how to do things and technology. You know, they're, they're whizzes of these things. They can help us in that. Uh, but uh, sometimes they can even impart wisdom to us uh, because they, they see things a little different than we did. So, I mean, brother, it's been, you know, a long time since I was a teenager. So <laughs> I'm not going to say how many years. Uh, but uh, I don't see things the way they do, and I didn't go through the things that they go through now. Uh, so they can help us. Uh, we don't use the wisdom of the aged enough. Uh, most of them didn't get there by being stupid. I mean, they, they didn't get to be old by, by doing dumb things. Uh, and even if they did make it there by, by doing dumb things, they've learned from them. Uh, and, and we need to, to learn from them, uh, listen to them. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, sometimes we, we think of, especially as, as I say younger preachers, because I haven't been doing this that long, we're afraid of people saying, well, we tried that 30 years ago and it didn't work. You know, there might be some wisdom in that. There might not be. But there might be someone who says, you know, we tried this 30 years ago and it didn't work because we didn't do this and we didn't do 
that. So we need to involve them. Uh, we don't use our church buildings enough to bring glory to God. And we meet in them two, three, four hours a week, and then what? We've got these great places to where God has, has blessed us with is these meeting houses, if you will, where they sit empty and idle for 164 hours out of the week. We need to figure out how to use them for the glory of God. I don't know how. I don't have all the answers of that. That is one thing that I definitely see. Uh, we don't take advantage of time. Uh, and I mean, as congregations even. We don't, we don't take advantage of time as we should. We, we let, waste a lot of it. We spend so much time talking about politics on Facebook. You know, how many Christians have lost their influence in the past two months because of politics? That's wasted time. And it's going to waste a lot of time to be able to get that influence back. Uh, we need to be worried about things of the kingdom right? and, and not about things that, that truly, truly don't matter. Yes, abortion matters. And yes, all these issues that we've talked about and heard about, they matter. But in the end run, where we are with God and, and where we are for eternity, uh, that's what really matters. Um, we don't use our money in the right ways enough. We waste a lot of money. You know, back to the facilities thing. Maybe we can't use our facilities efficiently because we have too much facilities. We have too big of buildings. We have upkeep that we have to keep on these huge buildings and we don't have a need for. We need to sell those things, maybe something smaller. Maybe we have spent so much in remodeling and revamping to where we're trying to make it attractive from the outside that we forget about we need to be making the church right on the inside. Uh, and it's just a way that we, we may be wasting some things. Uh, but uh, many churches have lots of money in the bank accounts. I've, I've seen this, and I've had preachers tell me this. I've had men tell me this. Uh, it's embarrassing what some congregations have in their bank accounts, and they aren't using some of them will have 100,000 plus in their bank, in the bank account, and are, are unwilling to give someone $50 to go and preach the gospel. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking, and not, not just as a missionary, but for anybody, that should be heartbreaking. We're not utilizing our money, God's money, like we should be. Um, I know some of them now are, are very, and a lot of them are very, very, very generous, and I uh, can't take away from that, but you know, I, I'd venture to guess that, that the churches that hold on to all those funds are probably going to be the, the very first ones to close their doors. Uh, not because they don't have the money to keep it open, because nobody's long, nobody's there any longer. Uh, they, they don't want to be there. Uh, there's nothing going on. There's no desire to reach the loss. There's no desire uh, to be on fire for God. Uh, there's just It's just not there. And that, that same mindset goes with the let's stockpile the money. Um, you know, it's frustrating, frustrating, of course, as a missionary, I, we have to talk about money, but it's frustrating knowing that the money's out there. It really is. There's enough money to send every man who truly wants to go and preach the gospel. But it's being wasted on so many other things, in my, in my opinion, or it's just not being used at all. And we have to fight to go get it. That should be the very last thing that any, any church worker should have to worry about is the funds to go do the work. But it's the thing we have to spend the most time worrying about. Uh, sorry, I'll get off that rant now. But uh, but obviously, uh, there are some who have a problem. Uh, I guess uh, something that, uh, going back to what are we underutilizing, many have a problem with giving back. And not even talking about money. Uh, they don't give back their time. Uh, they don't give back their abilities. You know, we have congregations where there will be one or two men who do everything. Uh, when sometimes it's because they don't allow others to do uh, do things and be involved, but sometimes it's because those people don't want to be involved. Uh, they don't they don't want to uh, take a chance that somebody might laugh at them when they're leading singing, <laughs> or maybe they may stumble when they lead a prayer. Who cares? God doesn't. He wants us to be involved. He wants us to use our abilities and to sharpen those abilities, and we're just not utilizing them as we should. Uh, giving back their passions. People don't give back that enough. Uh, we should be passionate, and I know you are, and I know many of us are passionate about taking the gospel to a lost and dying world, but many are so passionate about everything else that they're not passionate about uh, the work of the church, and, and that's something that we're just not utilizing uh, as we should. But back to there are back to this, there are some great and wonderful congregations and individuals uh, there are great exceptions to every bit of this, 
Uh, some churches I, I've known, uh, I've come to know, are beyond generous in, in how they, they handle things and how they treat workers and treat the work that needs to be done. Uh, I've heard of a congregation whose elders said, have been putting back so much money for a new building at one point. This has been years ago. But there was a particular need, I think a missionary that needed to be here to, to go to this point. And this is the work that needed to be done now. They, they, I say, took a chance, but they stepped out on faith and they took that money and they sent that man uh, because that was more important. Um, there are many like that. Uh, but you know, you mentioned this a while ago, a while ago God will provide um, and that he will provide workers. He will provide uh, the, the necessary funds to do the work. He's going to provide uh, the passion through people who have that passion. Um, you know, I've got a, I've got some supporters, or I say we've got some supporters that um, you know, it tingles my spine when I think about uh, how generous they are and what they do. We've got a couple that are 24 and 23 years old, recently married. Uh, they send between 350 and $400 a month to our mission fund. That's a young couple, great Christian couple. What could they do with that money every month? When I was 23 and 24, what could I do with that? So there are great exceptions to, to these things. They, they know there's a need, and they, they work to fill that need. I've got a, a lady who's a great, great friend of ours, a widow who, uh, when, her, when her crop dividends come back every year, you know, money she gets royalties from, from her farmland. Uh, first thing she does is, I think, to us and then one other, she, she sits down and writes a check. Uh, you know, those are the people who truly are passionate about uh, doing the work and sending those folks. So there are definitely exceptions to those not utilizing what they have. Uh, but as a whole, I think uh, we really need to step back and look at these things, our, our passions, our money, our, our abilities, our time, our facilities. Uh, what are we not utilizing uh, to the glory of God? Uh, he's given it to us, so why aren't we using it for him? And I I hear, heard you heard you say several times that these are the, the exceptions, and and you know that that might be the case, but I, I think also we can see them as th they're the examples. Yeah. You know, yeah. th they're they're the pattern. They're the ones who are who are applying. You know what what we all should be applying. What we all should be striving to do. Now now none of us can be perfect examples in everything, but we can take these examples. And we can see, we can utilize them and say, hey, these are things that these people are doing that I like what they're doing, and, and I, I look up to them. And we can take those things and you know incorporate into our own lives. Yeah, you're right, and that's something I had written down there too. Is that these these are great examples, and these yes. are people we need to look to. And and while we don't need to hold them up above any other, we need to hold them up as examples. We really do. And let folks know that hey, there are people who will do this. Amen. Well, Wade, thank you so much for coming and taking the time today to meet with me to talk about some positive things, some encouraging things. We all have so much potential. We all have so much that we uh, can do, and and hopefully that we we can show everybody in the church we can help lift each other up. That this is not a we're not islands, and that we we are this is a team sport, so to speak. And that, that we have to lift each other up, and and we can do that. And we have so many resources, so many tools, so many individuals that are that are ready. And ready. So thank you so much for coming. I'm looking forward to meeting with you more often. I'm glad you're down here nearby us on the coast here, and and Lord willing, we'll, we'll be able to do some good work together. Lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table land, a higher place. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up.